Welcome to Building a Resilient Transportation System, the final session of the Clean Fuels Summit virtual conference. And first, we want to get started by thanking our sponsors, um, Entergy and Amerigas, both of whom are Louisiana Clean Fuels members, and our supporting sponsor, Fuels Fix. It's a great publication. We encourage you all to check it out. All things alternative fuels um, from the Clean Cities coalitions across the country. So you're going to get, you know, great great articles about real life projects and um, some real information, up-to-date information you can begin using now. So, all right. To remind you, you are at Building a Resilient Transportation System. Uh, this Clean Fuel Summit is brought to you by Louisiana Clean Fuels and the Southeast Louisiana Clean Fuel Partnership, your two clean cities coalitions here in the state of Louisiana. So your presenters here today are your, your moderator, Dr. Cherry Chambers, who is the Director of Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy Center at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Rachel Shard, who's the Lead Project Manager of Buses at CalSTART, and Renee Sampson, Directory, Director of Regulatory Affairs uh, West at FreeWire. Typo. All right, so first we're going to get started talking to you about clean cities. Um, what is clean cities? If you have been to all of our sessions, you can probably get this presentation now. But uh, Clean Cities Coalition Network, we're a Department of Energy Program. So we are all designated clean cities coalitions. And what we do is we work together to build partnerships to advance affordable domestic transportation fuels and technologies. That is really good and succinct in a nutshell what we do. But we're that boots on the ground, the local grassroots efforts that are embedded in our communities and we understand our fleets and the areas that we serve. And so we can be that unbiased source of information that can help you reach your goals. So we're not looking to push a particular fuel or a product on a fleet or just push one solution. We wanna look at what your goals are, what, are you trying to achieve? Are you trying, is total cost of ownership more important? Is reducing your NOx, is reducing your carbon footprint? Or are you just trying to have a vehicle that has less downtime? So we look at all the different things that you have going on, the type of vehicles you have, and we pull together all the resources you need to make the most informed decisions um, possible. And so where do we fit in with the Department of Energy? In the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Division of the Department of Energy, there is the Vehicle Technology Office. And within that, we have these five main areas or pillars within that organization. And technology integration is where clean cities resides. So all of these, you know, batteries and electrification, material technologies, all the research they do on advanced engines and fuels and energy efficient mobility systems, we're the ones that bring it together and put it out into the community. So when it's ready to be um, implemented and uh, tried out by fleets and the, it's ready to go and on the market, that's where we come in and we help be that bridge between uh, the, the federal funding and your goals and to help you with the technology and to implement your projects. So the portfolio that we deal with is light, medium, and heavy duty vehicles, basically anything on the road. Alternative and renewable fuels and infrastructure. So as long as it is domestically produced, EPAC mandated fuel, um, electrification, CNG, propane, liquefied natural gas, hydrogen fuel cells, that's in our wheelhouse. And we also um, are very interested in idle reduction measures and fuel economy improvements. Those easy low hanging fruit projects and programs that really make a huge impact on reducing your emissions and help you with fuel savings and new mobility choices and emerging transportation technologies. So the Clean Cities Coalition Network has more than 75 active coalitions across the country. And almost no matter where you reside, there is a Clean Cities Coalition next to you. In fact, about 80% of the population of the United States lies within a Clean Cities Coalition territory. And so the two Clean Cities Coalitions in Louisiana, which cover the entire state, um, Louisiana Clean Fuels and Southeast Louisiana Clean Fuel Partnership are represented here and putting this uh, inform informative webinar series on for you all. 
And in a nutshell, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is we are working to connect you, our stakeholders, with fleets, fuel providers, industry partners, and experts who can help you get your project off the ground successfully. We offer training, webinars such as this, workshops, ride and drives, um, expos, informative sessions, and first responder training to help make sure that these projects go smoothly and that we remove all the barriers to implementing these projects. And you know, technical assistance, if there's an issue, there's a problem or something you have um, difficulty resolving, you can come to us and we can try to get some federal resources to help you with at least troubleshooting some of the issues that are going on. We help you identify funding and help you apply for that funding. And in many cases, we can partner together on projects. Um, if you were listened in on our first session, you can see some of the great grants that we have won recently and the projects that we're working on. And so those are the kinds of things that we would like to partner with you, our stakeholders. And we provide public recognition for our fleets who participate in our annual reporting process. So we collect data, we track progress, and we help track trends of what's going on in our state as well. So I'm going to kick it off and push it over to our fantastic moderator, Dr. Cherry Chambers. He's one of our favorites at Louisiana Clean Fuels. We always love going over there and uh, learning something new over at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. They've got a lot of great programs um, and projects over there. And I'm sure you all will be fascinated to learn what is going on just in one of our own homegrown universities here in Louisiana. So Terry, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to talk to you a little bit to get started here about all the different sustainable and resilient transportation research and education that's going on at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Next. Next, yeah. So I am the director of the Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy Center at the university. And we do clean energy research, education, workforce development, economic development, and outreach to the public. The center for which I'm the director is part of the larger Energy Institute of Louisiana that has consists of five different research centers focusing on different areas. And uh, we're also affiliated with the College of Engineering. <clears throat> Next. It's my Great honor and privilege to serve on the Governor's Climate Initiative Task Force. And I know that earlier in the uh, uh, in this uh, conference, you've talked about the Louisiana has recently published its first climate action plan. And I'm very proud to have been part of that. And in general, what I'm trying to do is to promote uh, sustainability and renewable energy throughout the state in every way that I can. And uh, my particular area of research, I'll talk to you about this a little bit more later, is solar energy. And uh, so what I try to do with solar is I uh, I go, I spend a lot of time myth busting, actually going around the state uh, helping people learn about solar energy and, and what it does and doesn't do. Um, I've published a solar resource guide for communities uh, so that they can help, uh, well, to answer a lot of the common questions. I, I'm participating in the effort to uh, craft our first model solar ordinance and uh, generally trying to bring uh, renewable energy businesses to Louisiana and to help Louisiana businesses uh, diversify their offerings to get into the clean energy business as well and uh, helping communities become solar ready and I can give training on the DOE Soul Smart program and so on. Next. We have probably 20 faculty members at UL Lafayette that are that are doing research that is related to this topic. So let me tell you a little bit about the transportation related research at the university. Next. We do uh, transportation policy, the Blanco Policy Center focuses on that. And then we also do a lot of different types of uh, engineering 
work with regard to transportation, dealing with uh, bridge structures, monitoring of bridges, uh, innovative materials, both for uh, roadways and, and others, uh, composite materials, low, carb, uh, low carbon concrete and so on, uh, designing traffic management systems, uh, repairing uh, bridge structures and condition, bridge condition assessment and so on. Next. With regard to electric vehicles in particular, Next, yeah, we, one of the things that I find most interesting is about uh, our electric vehicle research is the work by Dr. Raju Gatamakula, who is investigating the cybersecurity issues uh, surrounding electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging stations and building management systems. And he's uh, been working with the DOE and the Idaho National Lab to uh, identify vulnerabilities both in the vehicles and in the charging stations. And he's asking the question, uh, now that cars, especially electric vehicles, are essentially uh, rolling computers connected to the internet, is there a danger that someone might be able to hack the vehicle and therefore hack the charging station and therefore hack the building management system? And the answer is yes, uh, or at least uh, yes. But And then uh, they've discovered these vulnerabilities and then they work directly with the manufacturers to help resolve those vulnerabilities so that they don't exist anymore. So that's uh, really kind of a, a fun project that's going on next. We also are trying to uh, make uh, EV charging stations available. And uh, you've talked a little bit about the, the Volkswagen settlement uh, projects. If you go to the next page, we've applied for some of that. And I believe that we'll be getting some more charging stations around campus. So that's, uh, that's exciting as well. Next. We do a lot of work with bio-based fuels and chemicals, uh, some of which I think would, would be of interest to you. Next. Uh, one area that we've been doing a lot of work for a long time is hydrogen. Uh, <clears throat> we do work with uh, gasification, uh, biomass gasification, which produces syn gas, which is uh, largely hydrogen, hydrogen and carbon monoxide conversion of wastewaters and waste solids into biohydrogen and biogas using anaerobic digestion. We have faculty who are expert in the electrochemistry of uh, electrolyzers and also fuel cells. So that has a uh, transportation, you know, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, that's a transportation related issue. Uh, and uh, also using renewable energy to to drive these electrolyzers or gasification processes. Next. Um, we're working on uh, different ways to, uh, to develop, to produce the hydrogen uh, and to store it perhaps in, in uh, ammonia for one thing and uh, producing the hydrogen using concentrated solar thermal reactors. Next. And I know that you've also heard about this uh, proposal, which we're uh, working on with GNO Inc. and, and virtually every other large stakeholder group in the, in the state <clears throat> on a uh, large, uh, well, relatively large uh, proposal to the Department of Commerce Economic Development Authority uh, called H to the Future. And the, it's uh, focused on uh, building the hydrogen economy and we are working, uh, you know, we, we think this will hopefully be a first step towards uh, having Louisiana designated as one of uh, four DOE regional hydrogen hubs. And uh, we think that would be very helpful for the state's economy. And our focus, uh, in that project is 
the creation of green hydrogen through solar. That's our focus. And uh, creating test beds. Uh, so uh, in terms of these bio-based uh, methods, as I mentioned, we use anaerobic digestion for methane, hydrogen, uh, and other, other products as well that can be used as feedstocks for other, other products and fuels. Next. Uh, biofuel, uh, biodiesel from sewage sludge. That's one of the things we've been investigating. Next. And uh, also another method through uh, anaerobic digestion to produce uh, biodiesels as well. Next. And then we've got some thermal conversion technologies. Next. Including uh, Biomass gasification, we have a three ton a day fluidized bed gasification system, and that is a very large research grade test bed that anybody who has either a feedstock that they want to study or uh, a process that they want to study or some equipment they want to study, we've got a, a test bed that they can use for that. Next. Uh, we also have a test bed for biomass uh, creation of uh, a type of bio coal or biochar uh, using torrefaction. Next. And we have as recently established a C1 extension service. So any company that wants to uh, reduce their carbon usage or their, uh, or their carbon footprint while growing jobs, uh, we can provide technical assistance to you. Next. Other renewable energy research, which can have to do with, uh, that can tie into transportation uh, would include, next. Uh, we have a lot of multidisciplinary renewable energy research going on. Uh, systems engineering, uh, big data and visualization, cybersecurity, water and sanitation, emergency management, which comes into play with transportation, obviously, building energy management, which as I just mentioned, can come into play with EVs, materials, batteries, obviously that's in EVs and so on. Next. Now, I'm going to talk just for a few moments about my particular work. Uh, we're working very hard to build a national level solar energy program. Next. We have a one of the largest outdoor test facilities in the southeast part of the United States. And this uh, photo doesn't even capture the full extent of our outdoor test uh, facilities. Uh, this is a 1.1 megawatt outdoor test facility. Next slide, please. We have six research test stands that can be easily reconfigured to do, to test basically any type of solar related pro product uh, or process that you would like to test. We've got the, the capability to do those testing, that testing for you. Next. We're also in the process of uh, building a brand new indoor, uh, a laboratory and classroom building where we will have a lot of uh, state-of-the-art indoor test equipment for solar as well. Next. And we have uh, one of the largest and one of just a very few concentrating solar thermal pilot scale power plants in the Southeast part of the United States. This uh, uses a parabolic trough technology to essentially uh, convert the sunlight into thermal energy or heat. Uh, we heat up, uh, the short version is we heat up water. Well, yeah, heat up water, make steam, turn a turbine, generate electricity. Next, please. And this is something that we think is very uh, fun is that we're, we're upgrading that facility that you just saw to a general purpose grid test facility where we'll be able to test the effect on the grid or a portion of the grid 
down to the individual feeder level of different distributed energy generation sources and different uh, loads, such as EV charging stations. So we'll be able to simulate uh, and, and test at that facility uh, all different types of, uh, of like EV chargers, batteries, uh, and even uh, hydrogen production and storage and utilization at that site. Next. We do a lot in workforce development, so we've developed a lot of courses. Next. So we've created a renewable energy miner and we have uh, six courses directly related to solar. And then we've also next uh, developed a, a curriculum for a whole curriculum for solar technicians as well. And we have not only the, the, the curriculum and the courses, but also the facilities where we can train the solar technicians on how to do solar installations for both residential, commercial, and utility scale systems. Next. All right, so that's the end of my portion. So let's go on to our next speaker, uh, which will be Rachel Chard. Rachel. Thanks, Terry. Great presentation. I had no idea all that was going on. So it's okay. exciting. Um, I'll, I'll do next slide. I'll, I'll use my, there we go. <laughs> um, so thank you for having me today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about specifically resiliency in transportation. Um, I am the, the National Program Manager within the Bus Initiative at CalSTART. A little bit about my background. I, uh, prior to joining CalSTART, spent almost 10 years working in sustainability for K-12 school districts. Um, so focusing on um, efficiency and resource management within kind of the facilities of school districts. Um, I joined CalSTART about a year ago and am now specializing specifically on the transportation side, um, managing both transit and school district deployment projects um, for zero emission buses. So really exciting stuff and sort of the cross sector of, of what we're gonna be talking about today. Next slide. So for those of you that don't know the name CalSTART, um, oddly enough, we did get our start in California. Our headquarters are in Pasadena, California, but we're actually a global nonprofit organization um, with regional offices across the United States. So we have a, a regional office within the Northeast uh, in Brooklyn, another office in Michigan, right outside of Detroit, and then sort of a sprinkling of staff across the United States around those offices. Uh, the little orange leaf you see in Wisconsin, that's me. I'm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Next slide. We are a nonprofit membership organization. We have over 300 members that make up our membership everything from sort of the major vehicle manufacturers to utilities to everything that supports that in between. Um, so that's one of the resources we pull for presentations like such as this. Um, we have sort of a wealth of knowledge that we get to network with and help move the industry forward towards zero emission adoption. Next slide. So throughout our organization, we work across five initiatives that you see here. Um, both uh, light duty, we do trucks, buses, uh, innovative mobility, which is sort of all those unique things that don't necessarily fall into a category like uh, the scooters you may see on the side of the road. And then we have a whole fields and infrastructure team as well. So as my slide mentioned, I fall within our bus initiative in this. And then within each initiative, we work across a multiple, multitude of activities. Um, we do some technology development and demonstration. Uh, I think that's probably where what I'm going to talk about falls within CalSTART. Um, but we also do a lot of data collection and assessment. We have a project right now with the DOE to collect data on zero emission deployments. We do a lot of market acceleration. We have working groups across the country that bring together transit agencies and folks such as yourself um, to just kind of talk about what's going on in the industry right now, provide up-to-date information and kind of a snapshot of what's going on in the market. Um, and then we have industry services for all of our members that participate as part of CalSTAR, and we do have policy work as well. Next slide. Great. So one thing uh, that we do annually at CalSTAR that we've kind of presented on in the past for Anne and her team is 
uh, an annual zero emission bus adoption report. We now have both one for uh, the transit side of the industry. And then last year we published our first annual for the school bus industry. Um, so these are essentially an inventory of, of adoption for zero emission buses across the country and, and also Canada. Next slide. So I just wanna share sort of a snapshot of what does zero emission bus adoption look like um, across the country. This is uh, the most recent data that we have in this year's report, which is a the 2021 report. This data was collected, uh, stopped collected as of September of 2021. So hopefully these numbers have increased since then. Um, but you can see we're starting to see a significant increase year over year in zero emission bus adoption. We have, you know, just over 3,000, um, sorry, my numbers are <laughs> tiny, just over 3,000 battery electric buses that are in the adoption process um, in the U.S. And then uh, almost 200 um, also fuel cell buses. So I know that, that Terry mentioned fuel cell buses, that's certainly not a sector of the industry we're ignoring. And it's definitely something that's growing as well, as you can see by our growth percentages. Next slide. And then looking a little bit closer to home for you all as, as part of our Louisiana focus, um, this is region six, FDA region six. So you can see um, some of the numbers more, more closely aligned with where you all are located. So Louisiana has about 31 battery electric buses. They don't have any fuel cell buses right now, um, but nearby states like Texas are, are starting to grow in that area. So overall, this is an industry that is, is certainly not slowing down and we're seeing more and more adoptions across the country. Next slide. And then this is on kind of on the other side of things on the school bus industry. This is uh, sort of like the little sister, I would say, to transit in the way that adoption is occurring. And that um, it's sort of following closely behind what transit has been doing for the last 10 years. So we have just over 1700 electric school buses across the country that are in the process of being adopted. Uh, the majority of those by far are within the state of California. Uh, that has a lot to do with funding, but also policy that's, that's occurring within that state. But then we're also seeing large orders across the US in other states like Maryland and Florida. Um, a lot of this had to do with Volkswagen funding that was distributed in these states. So these numbers um, are also increasing significantly. They were captured as of September of last year as well. Um, but we already know that these, that these are essentially out of date and um, will be growing significantly with the EPA funding that is becoming available. Next slide. So just to give you guys an idea of what it actually looks like to power a fleet of electric vehicles, uh, this is a nice little graphic we use across CalSTART fairly often. So some of you may have your own personal vehicles. You may not have a Chevy Volt, but you, you understand kind of the equivalent of what that might look like. Um, so you're using a roughly 330 kilowatts uh, to, to power 100 of those. So that's a significant size fleet if you think of maybe a white fleet. Um, for a company. And then it, it sort of expands significantly from there. So if you're looking at maybe a medium duty box truck, um, you're at 1.5 megawatts. Uh, think about that in relation to the solar that Terrence just uh, referenced that they had 1.1 megawatts. Um, so now kind of going up in, in scale, what a, a significantly sized building would use. And, and then beyond that is what 50 electric buses would use. Um, so we're looking at three megawatts 50 electric buses is, is nowhere near the largest fleet size in the country, as I assume some of you would know. Um, and, you know, whether that's transit or school buses, that's, I would say, a fairly common size for fleets, maybe not in, in rural applications, but certainly in more urban um, or even slightly more dense uh, applications. So it's a significant amount of load on the grid to, to charge and to power a large scale fleet. Um, of electric buses. Next slide. So why we're all here today, there is certainly a need for resiliency in transportation. Um, not only do battery electric buses rely on electricity as their fuel source, you know, switching from uh, whether it be an alternative fuel source or diesel or gas, um, switching to the grid or switching to power, you're, you're now reliant on that. But also, you know, fuel cells were mentioned too. Those do need a certain amount of electricity as well to operate um, their, their fueling equipment. So it's not that that completely removes it from the grid either. Um, we're also seeing that grid outages can prevent charging or fueling. That's no secret. If you don't have power, it, you might 
not be able to charge. Uh, that's a little bit of basics of electricity there for you. Um, and I, I would say is a concern for some people uh, or some fleets that are interested in adopting uh, zero emission buses. And then we also know that extended power outages are becoming more common due to natural disasters and emergencies. Um, it's no secret that weather is changing and we're certainly feeling the impacts a little bit of it. So uh, power outages are becoming more and more common and could impact people's decisions or transit agencies or school district decisions to, to go towards more zero emission. Um, and then transit agencies need to retain access. So if, if we know that the industry is moving towards zero emission, how do we sort of solve for that issue before it becomes an issue? So if we, if we can identify, we know the industry is moving this way, but we also know that we need to sort of factor in grid instability or um, maybe a fuel source that isn't as uh, stable or maybe stable in a different way. Um, we need to make sure that we can account for that within our planning. Next slide. So this is a graphic from FEMA that just shows what the, the national risk index for uh, natural hazards is. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody probably on this call. Um, just last year, some of the, the craziness that ensued with, with our weather was uh, extreme freezing in Texas. I think you guys all, all saw that pretty closely, um, that that was very abnormal. We also saw extreme heat in Washington and Oregon, which stressed the grid. Um, we saw you know, flooding and fires in California. That's, that's not even new to 2021. That, that hasn't been unique for a while in that state. You know, we saw a category four hurricane here in Louisiana. Um, we saw crazy late fall tornadoes across the U.S., you know, everywhere from, from here down, you know, down south in Louisiana all the way up through, you know, New York and New England. Um, and we even saw a blizzard in Hawaii. So these are just some of the examples of some of the extreme weather that we're having across the country. Next slide. So how is that impacting the power grid? Um, essentially, it's increasing the difficulty of load and supply forecasting. So, you know, when people that are producing power have to kind of figure out um, how and when uh, to produce that power, when it's going to be needed, um, and how it's going to be generated. So, the uh, these natural disasters that are occurring are, are making that sort of prediction a little bit more challenging. It's also causing a greater demand on uh, the electrical grid in general. So, when there's extreme heat, for example, in Washington and Oregon, that puts a strain on the grid that the grid was not designed for when people are running air conditioning or, or um, other you know, sources of electricity in their homes. And then on the opposite side, when we're seeing extreme cold, um, or sorry, <laughs> the opposite of that, heating, heating when it's cold and cooling when it's hot. Oh, my apologies, that's basic. <laughs> um, so yeah, anytime you're seeing an, an extreme weather on either end of that, it's pulling uh, more from the grid than maybe the grid was intending for to be pulled. Um, and then also, and this was really evident in Texas as well, that infrastructure is more susceptible to outages if, if it's not designed to handle those types of weather events. Um, so, you know, if things aren't uh, designed to handle extreme cold, uh, things can go wrong. Um, and, and the same for the opposite. So if things aren't designed to handle extreme heat, uh, for example, in northern climates, uh, that's going to cause issues on the grid as well. So all of these issues of natural disasters can certainly have a significant impact on the grid. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about microgrids. I think Renee is probably going to cover this in more detail, would be my guess. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll sort of lay a little bit of groundwork and then hopefully she'll bring in some solutions, which is great. Um, so essentially, it's a small network of electricity users uh, with a local source of supply that's usually attached to a centralized uh, utility grid, but is able to function independently. Um, this is a way that we can address grid resiliency while allowing the system to island and off operate off-grid if needed. Uh, so essentially, you can a little bit have your cake and eat it too in some ways. Um, so you can produce your own power, for example, with uh, a solar PV array. Um, and either use it yourselves or feed it back to the grid um, and, and be able to you know, be connected or not connected depending on what the needs are both for you and, and the grid you're connected to. Um, and then there's also the capacity of them to generate revenue if, if that is an option with your utility provider or sort of the setup that you have um, within your location. Next slide. So I just wanted to show you 
This is a design mock-up that we did for a transit agency or in partnership with a transit agency in California. Um, this is what it, uh, kind of a full system could look like um, at a, a transit agency. So you can see it's a significant size solar array over a parking lot um, at their transit agency, at their transit agency. Next slide. So I sort of alluded to this in the past slide, but there are certainly benefits to having a microgrid um, connected to your transit system. Um, for one, it, it can be instantaneous power when needed. Um, it's a lot more flexible. As I mentioned, you can kind of be on grid or off grid, uh, depending on what everyone's needs are. Um, it also is asset diversification. So it, it's another asset you can add to your portfolio as, as an entity um, that isn't just maybe your buses or your facilities. Um, it, it's essentially another uh, step beyond that. Um, it does have increased renewable content, so you can make your zero emission buses even greener if you'd like um, and have more control over where your power is actually coming from. And then there are, as I mentioned, some potential revenue opportunities with it. And this is really dependent on the programming that your utility offers and sort of what's available to you, but um, it's possible to have some peak shaving. Um, which is somewhat, you can see in this picture, hopefully you can see this image. Um, so essentially when power is at its highest price and highest use, um, you can sort of chop that off by using your own power that you're generating on site and being less reliant on the grid. Um, areas where LCFS credits are available, there's uh, more opportunity or, or increased benefit by adding a microgrid to your services. Um, you can participate in demand response, which is often a revenue generator in partnership with utilities. Um, and then you can also sort of regulate the frequency too of the power coming at your site. Next slide. So I just wanted to briefly cover some trends that we're seeing across the industry. You know, I mentioned CalStart works across the country. We work both in transit and in school districts on the bus side of things. Um, but, but we work across initiatives in general. Um, so we see a lot of the transportation industry. Um, so some of the things we obviously covered that natural weather events are becoming more extreme. Um, so we're seeing in general, just more power disruption, which can be an issue if you're trying to adopt to zero emission vehicles. Um, but we're also seeing sort of this cross section of both the building and the transportation industry shifting towards electrification. Um, this is especially happening in states that have electrification, electrification goals uh, for their buildings. So states like California, for example, um, it's really causing entities like transit agencies or government buildings to look more holistically at their energy use. So instead of just you, instead of just looking at your transportation individually, you know, by fuel site, by fuel source, um, or at your building, um, they're sort of looking at both of them and combining them and, and trying to figure out how they can manage all of their energy use um, if it's all going to be moved towards electric. And then um, we're also seeing that connecting EV infrastructure to the grid can be challenging. So uh, essentially you're somewhat reliant on working with your utility to get your charging infrastructure in place. And we're finding that, you know, timelines are being pushed out and um, other challenges are occurring when trying to do this. And so we're seeing transportation providers, for lack of better terms, trying to figure out how to get around that in some ways and saying, okay, if we can remove utilities from, or at least partially uh, from, our deployment project, um, what are some solutions to do that? Um, and so they're exploring these more standalone solutions that um, can benefit, you know, not just the utility in the long run, but also themselves and their community. And so what that actually looks like, oh, sorry, can you go back to slide? <laughs> what that actually looks like then in practice is we're seeing uh, transportation providers seeking more assistance. So where we, in previous years, we're seeing, you know, typical maybe route modeling or route selection, maybe help with procurement of buses. We're now seeing sort of a next level of assistance request, and which is things like energy modeling and microgrid analysis, and even getting to the point of resiliency planning within their transportation plans. So these are words that, that they probably weren't even using uh, five, definitely 10 years ago but we're now seeing them be more and more common in the services that they're asking for. 
And then we're seeing, and I think Renee will definitely cover this, uh, more companies offering microgrid solutions as part of EV infrastructure packages. So sort of these, these more holistic um, packages of offering. So if you're going to be adopting zero emission transportation options, and you know you need to put in EV infrastructure, there are companies that are able to kind of pair that with microgrids um, and sort of offer you an all-in-one solution. So this is becoming more and more common um, across the industry and, and we're seeing more and more members, new members of CalStart that sort of specialize in this area. And then thankfully, we're also seeing more funding for the planning and impl implementation of these projects. Um, so whereas previous funding was maybe more uh, just general rebates around vehicles and infrastructure, we're starting to see both at the federal and the state level more kind of unique examples um, of sort of, okay, what's the next step beyond a typical zero emission deployment? Um, and what are what can we also be thinking about that maybe makes these, these projects more sustainable in the long run? Next slide. And so specifically, um, these are some of the projects that CalStart is working on. We have been funded to do uh, microgrid deployment projects uh, with three transit agencies within California. Uh, so you saw the ATN Anaheim Transit Network. That was the mock-up image that I shared earlier. Um, but then we also have more planning and feasibility studies um, that we just got funding for uh, with Santa Barbara and Porterville Transit. So, I know these are all within California, um, but we're seeing and hearing these questions across the country. Um, you know, in talking to Anne, I, we like to say like the three coasts. So we're definitely seeing it in California, but we're seeing it sort of in the Northeast, um, in the, you know, New York, New England area, but also down uh, sort of in the Gulf too, because we know that, that you all are seeing, you know, are impacted by some of these issues more than maybe other parts of the country. And so, um, we hope to expand this list in the future um, as more and more agencies are sort of exploring this as an option with their deployments. Next slide. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Hold on. All right, so next up we have Renee. Yep. Hi, everybody. You can go to the next one. I believe is our company one. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Renee Sampson. I'm the Director of um, Regulatory Affairs and Policy for Freewire Technologies. Um, I've been there for a little over a year and a half and, and cumulatively have about 10 years of experience in the EV charging uh, policy world and industry world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Freewire itself. Next. So FreeWire Technologies um, makes a really unique product that doesn't otherwise exist in North America. We're the only uh, company currently putting this product out into the marketplace. We were founded in 2014 and our original products were mobile level two charging uh, stations. And we've since moved on to this DC fast charging station that I'll get into more later. Um, but basically we, we provide a really flexible um, low infrastructure or infrastructure light um, product and power solutions that can leverage energy storage for rapid and sustainable electrification. And you can see um, uh, we have deployed in many different verticals or markets, including with utilities, with um, automotive producers, with cities and fleet operators across the US. Uh, we did just complete our Series D funding. Uh, so we were very happy to, uh, to announce that a couple months ago with BlackRock as our lead investor <clears throat> and previously having BP um, be one of our lead investors in our Series C, and so as you as you just look at some of the customers and the and the world class investors here, you know with BP and with um, Philip sixty six and a few of the others, you can see that even the oil and gas companies are are starting to to think about um, the future of of how we fuel our vehicles. I apologize for my voice; I've got a little bit of an allergy situation happening today, uh, but you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so as Rachel touched on, you know, we have an electrification dilemma here in the US in many spots on the grid. Um, 
It, it consists of the electrical supply, uh, the cost. Sometimes there can be a high cost of electricity and not necessarily compared to gasoline, but um, still it's a factor. Uh, charging demand, and then the space. Where do we have the space to put uh, the to put EV charging, and where will folks most likely want to go to charge their cars? Go next. And really, the one of the biggest hurdles that we have to get over is is the grid infrastructure. Um, I don't know who on this call has seen um, this map on the right-hand side of California, but this is what we affectionately call the Red Sea Map. And it was put out, the California Energy Commission um, did a study, we have a bill called AB 2127 that looked at our <clears throat> electrification and the grid and some of the constraints. And what they found is over 50% of the circuits and transformers cannot take on additional impact or additional load without substantial uh, grid infrastructure upgrades. So right now, without a battery or a microgrid grid solution, our EV charging technology is lar largely dependent on grid infrastructure. Um, so <clears throat> we are looking to uh, you know, solve that problem with our technology. Go to the next one. And this is especially relevant now that the federal funding is coming to all of the states. And so, in, you know, in my industry, that's all we talk about since like February is uh, what they call NEVI. So if, if you're not familiar with the federal um, policy and the federal funding that's coming out, every state has been uh, given a bucket of funds and that's gonna be deployed in two separate tranches. The first one, what we're, we're calling the NEVI um, deployment is about $5 billion that's going to every single state. And the federal government has put in some very prescriptive requirements around what those programs must look like. So the money is handed off to the state DOT along with a set of, of minimum requirements that, that need to be met for each one of these sites. And we've been, been you know, talking almost on a daily basis with other states, with the federal folks, uh, and with others that are concerned about some of these requirements and how that aligns with those grid infrastructure constraints that, that I just mentioned. So at a very, very high level, uh, what they want is a minimum of four 150 kilowatt stations every 50 miles along designated alternative fuel corridors. So this first round of this program is really gonna concentrate on building out, um, building out all of these highways and um, getting them every 50 miles. And then eventually states can add some additional uh, corridors that they've made a request for. Uh, some states have, there's been some chatter about considering even higher power installations than that. So um, it, in Oregon, they were talking about requiring <clears throat> at every location, not just locations where it's suitable, um, a 350 kilowatt station as well, um, substituting one of those four. 150 kilowatt uh, stations. And, um, you know, we've had some more discussions with them and I think they've realized that, that there's just gonna be a number of locations in the more rural areas where that is just not possible. Um, and unfortunately right now where we're at too is that they are not allowing power sharing that lowers the capacity below 150 kilowatts. So what this means is if you're required to put in four stations, um, that those stations can't power share with each other even if the car is not asking for 150. And, and I'll come back at the end to the point about um, what the car asks for uh, should be driving what some of these deployments and requirements look like. So, so a number of these challenges, a lot of rural locations don't even have three phase power. Um, uh, and th so that becomes a problem. You've got urban areas with serious grid constraints you have um, utilization in early years that makes most installations unattractive for site hosts. And so what this means is if you put in a very expensive station and you're only getting one or two charges a day, or in some places it might be a week, um, you're just not ever gonna get a return on investment. And so that makes it, it really frankly an unattractive uh, project to deploy. Um, demand charges are going to be extremely prohibitive in many locations for traditional DC fast charging. And for those of you not familiar with demand charges, it's this um, concept that utilities have to, if everybody turned on all their lights 
at the same time, you have to you have to be able to build your grid to, to meet that peak demand. And so a lot of commercial customers end up paying uh, not only for the per kilowatt hour electricity that they utilize, but they also have to, ha to pay a fee that that accounts for the, their chunk of that demand. So whatever the peak that they use in a certain time period, they get hit with these fixed um, peak charges and they can often be as high as 75% of the total electricity bill. So going back to a station with very low utilization, if one car pulls up to a 200 kilo or 150 kilowatt station and instantaneously is pulling 150 kilowatts off the grid and nobody else is charging that day or the next day, um, then that has become one of the most expensive charging sessions you're ever going to see. And site hosts don't always want, want to take on that risk. Um, and then there's, and frankly, one of the things we're advocating for is a need to incentivize resilient grid resources. Can you go to the next one? Um, on the char charging curve part of this, for those not super familiar with how EV charging uh, and, and electric vehicles talk to each other, um, what you typically see is that a the vehicle controls uh, how much charging they're asking for on a DC fast charging station. And they're designed in a way to protect the battery life of the car battery. And so at very high powered stations, they will take a big gulp in the first five minutes or so. And then it starts to taper off, which is what all of these different charging curves are. So these are for different types of vehicles and, and how they charge. So you can see, you know, a really high powered one, like a, like the Porsche Taycan has one of the highest power capacities uh, or abilities to, ch to charge on the market right now. And it drops off fairly early and then just goes off a cliff. And we have done an analysis of all of the cars that can um, take more than 150 kilowatts and charging at 150 kilowatt station versus a 350 kilowatt station only, only um, saves about an additional two minutes on their charging curve. So it's a, um, it's a lot, a lot of infrastructure and a very expensive project to save just a few minutes when you're charging. And with this, I'm talking about light duty, uh, not necessarily medium duty and heavy duty charging. You can move to the next slide. All right, so what, what is FreeWire doing to try to solve some of, the, some of these issues with, uh, with the grid and with resiliency around charging? Next. We, uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very, very unique uh, product. We have the only battery integrated DC fast charging station um, in North America right now. And what makes this really unique is that we've got this 100 and, 160 kilowatt hour battery that's in the bottom half of our station. Uh, we've got these next next generation power converters, and 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 what it means is that we're able to connect to the grid at low voltage power, but deliver a high voltage charge to a car. So a typical charging station is connecting to the grid at high voltage for uh, 480, 480 volts, and that requires a lot of infrastructure. So many many sites don't have high voltage on site yet. Um, so typically your an installation is going to be quite expensive to put in a DC fast charging station. And those expenses are, you know, pun intended, sunk costs. They're sunk into the ground. So you put in a lot of um, conduit, high power uh, uh, equipment, switch gear. Um, oftentimes, I'd say the majority of the time, you may need a transformer upgrade. And those costs really rack up both for the utility and for the customer on the customer side of the meter. So what makes our station unique is that we are connecting to the grid at no more than 27 kilowatts. So the battery acts as a buffer between the car, the vehicle demand and the grid. So the battery is, is the demand on the grid rather than the vehicle itself. And then the battery converts that power along with the our inverters and delivers that high power charge to a vehicle. Go to the next one. Yeah, and we get um, our battery, our batteries, they come from um, Nissan. Nissan's provider, Envision is the company. And so we have um, uh, all American made components within, within those batteries. You can go to the next one. 
Yeah, so I, I don't think I need to go through all of these again. As I mentioned, um, I want to do do want to hit on the time delays because I think Rachel noted this that one of the challenges uh, currently with some of the utility side infrastructure upgrades and what's going to get worse as every state is vying for uh, for the federal funds are delays in transformer uh, procurement times. So we're seeing typically in California it's anywhere between twelve and twenty four months. Uh, time frame for a deployment of a DC fast charging location. Um, I will give you an example. One of our fleet customers was in downtown um, San Francisco. Um, they wanted a behind the fence, uh, meaning not public, installation. And uh, the city told them and PG&E told them it would be 18 months before they could get those four stations. And they needed them yesterday. So they called, uh, they called FreeWire and we had them installed in two weeks. Um, uh, inflexibility is another one I'd like to point out uh, that is, you know, goes to those sunk costs that are in the ground and the inability to really use that charging station as, as, a, as a grid resource above and beyond uh, doing some managing of, of smart charging. You can go to the next one. Uh, I've just, I included this in here to show you the small footprint because if you do see our station in person, it does look big. However, when you, when you compare it to a typical installation that then also has all these power cabinets and other components that are may or may not be beside the stations, they might be kind of back and hidden away, but it's a much, much smaller footprint because you're not putting all that infrastructure in. Next one. And, and so what I really wanna emphasize here is this battery allows our EV charging station to be utilized not just as an EV charger, but as a grid resource. So our, uh, we're coming out shortly in a few months with a grid down version of our product. So when your grid goes down, when we have power safety uh, shutoffs in California, or you may have climate related um, shutdowns in Texas or in Louisiana, you can utilize our, you could still charge cars with our battery, uh, which means at least you're going to get a throughput of, you know, eight, 10, 12 vehicles if it's a relatively short um, period of time. The next iteration after that coming next year is, does utilize that bi-directionality. So when you're thinking about microgrids, how do you both use our battery to charge cars and to keep a site up and running? So we'll be able to provide power both back to the grid and if the station is, um, is configured correctly, can also be used as a grid asset by that site owner. Um, so if you're a 7-Eleven, a convenience store or a gas station, uh, if there's a power outage, folks with gas cars can't go anywhere either as soon as they run out of gas because those gas pumps take uh, electricity to work and to be able to fuel their vehicles. You can utilize that power within our battery to keep your uh, point of sale system running to keep your gas station running to keep the lights on at least for some period of time while that while that um, outage is happening. You can go ahead. Um, yep, and we have. Uh, I just have. I have this in here to illustrate that multifunctional energy asset. We can. We can also and have in. Um, I believe Nevada. We've. Uh, put out our first station uh, a year or two ago that's paired with solar panels. So completely off the grid. Um, it sits in a remote area of, of Nevada, but it's, it's utilizing our battery and our solar power to provide EV charging without any connection to the grid whatsoever. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to illustrate another really important point, and this doesn't necessarily go to resiliency of the grid, but it does go to uh, a, a, the really important point I made earlier about demand charges. And so what you're looking at here on this, on the left is, um, is what a typical bill would look like with traditional DC fast charging. As you can see, the vast majority of the bill are extremely expensive demand charges, and which are dropped down about 70 75% when utilizing a battery integrated um, solution, whether that's integrated into the station or just co-located co battery storage. And then it also, you can see the, how it flattens out um, and reduces those red peaks uh, down to a much more manageable and predictable level uh, for our customers. And I think, I think that's my last slide, right? There we go.
All right, so thank you very much. We are going to be pitching this back to Terry for a Q&A session. And uh, everyone out there who has questions for our panelists, it's time to queue them up. Well, first of all, thanks to uh, our speakers for bringing uh, some focus to this discussion of resilience. Uh, I appreciated the, the way that there was a discussion of what some of the threats might be to, to our transportation system, you know, in terms of weather and so on, and also some of the technology that can help mitigate that. Um, Renee just spoke about uh, energy arbitrage, using the batter battery for energy arbitrage. And uh, also uh, there was a discussion about peak shaving. Um, one of the things that I'm in touch with because I'm a solar guy is the fact that uh, solar generation occurs primarily around noon, solar noon, and uh, peak demand is in usually in the evening when everybody gets home from work and starts uh, cooking dinner and taking baths. So, uh, plus the fact that solar is uh, an intermittent uh, resource as is wind. So, uh, this, this idea, all of these ideas can kind of come together in one issue, which is what if we had about a million electric vehicles connected to the grid uh, and they all have batteries, that would be an enormous amount of battery storage and could potentially provide uh, grid stability services uh, to help stabilize the grid, uh, as well as these energy arbitrage functions and so on. So, uh, Renee, you, you were talking about the use of your uh, battery integrated EV charging station that uh, could I guess be used that way? What about uh, uh, vehicle to grid or bi-directional charging? Do either of you have a, have something you'd like to say about that? Yeah, um, if you don't mind, Rachel, I'll start. Okay. Um, yeah, and and so one of the things as as the policy person from FreeWire that <laughs> I'm really trying to educate people on is is it has to be bigger than vehicle to grid. So vehicle to grid great for buses, especially school buses, uh, any kind of fleet that sits overnight. Um, but for most people owning a light duty vehicle, it's just, I don't, I don't personally believe it's realistic that that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I also think that most people don't want the utility in their battery of their car, which has a warranty <laughs> with their automaker to be cycling their battery in such a way that it's going to drastically reduce the life of that battery. So I, um, encourage people to think about not just B to G, but also what I call B to G, or we could call it C, C to G once there's a few more of us out there, uh, really being able to utilize the charging, the charging system and that battery that's in the charging system itself to provide that resiliency rather than relying on, you know, me driving my little bolt and wanting to make sure that I'm getting where I need to go on time. Yeah, I'll echo a lot of what Renee said. Um, I do think it, it makes more sense in the application of maybe a bus fleet um, where, you know, like she mentioned, school districts and uh, the common sort of duty cycle is to have that downtime in the middle of the day. Um, so to be able to feed it back or to even have downtime throughout the summer when, you know, you have a high peak demand, um, it makes a little bit more sense with that duty cycle. Um, the other thing I want to note with that, though, is uh, it's not as maybe widespread uh, as, as those of you on this call might think. Um, you know, vehicle to grid is still sort of in pilot phase. Um, you know, there's a few pilots sprinkled throughout the country, at least within, you know, the transit or, or school district side of things. Um, and it's really dependent on what the utility allows. So in a lot of cases, it's not even allowed within states uh, to offer this service or, or, or to sort of set up a, a, a situation like this. And so that's one thing um, that, some providers are looking at maybe changing the policy on that or working with their utilities to develop a program around that, but it is still a very new technology. And I think they're still trying to figure out sort of what the appropriate application is of it. And then also, um, you know, what benefit does it actually bring? So sort of measuring what that could look like on a scaled version. All right. Um, something else I wanted to uh, 
to ask you all about is uh, whether, you know, we already mentioned some of these uh, threats to the transportation system in terms of extreme weather and, and so on. Uh, how do you feel that that, uh, that that issue is either helped or hurt by uh, alternative fuel vehicles? Do they, are they part of the solution or are they another problem that we have to also solve in our transportation system? Either one of you. Do you want me to take that already? Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, so I don't think it's as black and white as help or hurt. I think it, it sort of depends on the way you're looking at it or, or depends on if you're looking at it long-term or short-term. Um, you know, there is the benefit of maybe moving away from traditional fossil fuels um, and, and towards a, a more renewable energy source, which is possible uh, moving towards electrification. Um, but it, it's also no secret, and we, we both talked about it today, that uh, our grid isn't the most stable the way it is. And so it's a matter of if we are moving in the direction of electrifying more or relying more on the power grid, um, that in order to, to, to be resilient with it or be more sustainable with it, that we need to look at some of the, the upgrades uh, or some of the improvements that need to be done to the grid as a whole. Um, you know, Renee showed that slide of the state of California. I highly doubt that's unique across the country. Um, I know it's not on the East Coast as well. Um, and so, yeah, essentially the, the, the way the grid is right now, it is gonna be challenging to electrify um, at a pace that we might want to. So I, I think it's it, it's going to take some work, but it can be a, a benefit to resiliency if done properly. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Let me uh, let me ask those on behalf of the group. Uh, will hydrogen fueling stations be built? to similar standards as the EV charging stations with the NEVI funds? And is there affordable technology for citizens to create their own hydrogen at home? So I am not a hydrogen expert, if anybody <laughs> else. I can I can talk a lot about EV standards and, the, and what's going on with um, EV standards across the country, including, you know, in, in Louisiana, there was the weights and measures issue that was happening and how you can, how you can charge. Um, but when it comes to hydrogen, I'm not an expert. In fact, I, I had so many questions for you when you were going through your slides, Terry. <laughs> well, let's let Tyler weigh in on that. Tyler? Let's jump in um, kind of about two things with that. Uh, one being the, the NEVI standards part of it. So NEVI in, on its own is only for uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So that would rely on maybe the two and a half billion dollar portion of the infrastructure bill funds that went to, that is going to infrastructure. So there's a, a $1.25 billion call out that can go potentially to hydrogen fueling infrastructure. So that we don't know about. We'll know more about that towards the end of the year, I think is when we're expecting information about that particular grant program. Um, we talked about that a little bit earlier today in our grants webinar. Um, so we don't really know uh, in terms of that. We will probably expect some sort of standards for standard, like standardization of, uh, or standardization of those fueling stations to make sure that they work with all vehicle types and that sort of thing. Uh, but we don't have a huge amount of clarity into that yet. Um, and then I think Terry could probably talk a lot more about the actual production of hydrogen um, portion of things. But to my understanding, there, there are no real uh, ways to get that done at home. And for most fueling stations for hydrogen, um, the, they're re really refueled by, by trucking in that hydrogen uh, to be stored on site. They're not even really tapping into pipelines. So, but Terry may have some, some additional information to add there as well. Well, what we're seeing, I think, is that, uh, well, we don't really have the hydrogen infrastructure in place for transportation, not even as much as we do for EVs, and, and that would take a long time. I think that my personal feeling is that the, the first uses will be primarily industrial and that the generation of hydrogen will be on the industrial scale as well. That's where I think we're going to see it. I don't I'm not aware of any commercially available technology to generate hydrogen at the residential scale. Like there is solar, for example, at residential scale or commercial scale. It's not really there for hydrogen right now, I don't think. 
We have another question in the chat. Uh, with the introduction of WPT into the industry, do you think many of the smaller EV charging stations will use this technology? Either. Um, yeah, I'll take that for now. Um, I'm assuming they're, yeah, they're talking about wireless charging. Uh, frankly, I think that that's, that's uh, for large scale has not been a proven out technology. I think that there are still a lot of challenges with that technology and, and being in the EVSE, the, the charging industry, I haven't heard um, at any sort of mass scale about any company who's really rolling it out. Um, it's, it's kind of similar to like battery swapping in the cars. You know, it requires a lot of uh, industry standards that the OEMs have to agree to. And, and you know, same with, same with that, it would require a lot of standardization um, that both the vehicles and the charging technology can, can agree on. Um, I think it's probably more likely to happen for some, you know, larger trucks, but uh, I have, I have, I don't know, Rachel, if you've seen it at yeah. all. I, I haven't seen an installation yet. I haven't seen it, say, in light duty, which is kind of what the question is getting at. You know, we do have examples of it in the transit industry. There are some transit agencies, uh, specifically Antelope Valley in California, has a, uh, partnered with Wave to do some wireless charging. Um, that's probably the most well-known example of it. Um, and it's my understanding, too, that there's there's some kind of tweaking or retrofitting to the vehicle in order to make sure that it does it kind of accept that charge or does is compatible with that charging style. So getting to Renee's point of, uh, you know, we already have that issue of making sure electric vehicles um, and, you know, your standard EVFD equipment is compatible. I think adding another layer of wireless um, would complicate things right now. So I, I haven't seen that on the light duty side. And I think we're just starting to see more examples of it on the more medium heavy duty side. You know, it's interesting that uh, over in, uh, I believe it's France, they just said, okay, for your phone charging, we're only going to use USB-C, right? And it goes kind of the issue, it brings up the issue of industry standards, which can, if you adopt a standard too soon, it can limit innovation. If you adopt it, adopt it too late, it can be wasteful uh, and it can prevent growth in the industry. So there's industry standards are an issue, but that sort of provides a nice segue to something else I wanted to talk about, which is policy, which is adjacent to standards. So uh, what do you feel is, I'd like each of you to weigh in briefly on what you think are some of the most crucial policies that need to be changed or adopted in order to uh, promote resilience in the transportation industry. I'm going to let Renee take that one since she's a policy person. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh, do I have to just pick one or two, Terry? There's so no, many. No, go ahead. Just talk yeah. for a minute. Yeah, what's your uh, I, Well, I mean, the thing that I run across a lot is is program design that has occurred in a way that doesn't it's not inclusive of innovative technologies. So you're looking for grant money, you're wanting to get stations in the ground very quickly. And folks just assume there's one type of technology, they all work the same, they're all connected the same. And so then requirements are written in a way that can exclude others. You know, um, uh, like Beam is another interesting company that combines solar with uh, EV charging and they are not connected to the grid at all. And so they can roll a truck up and just, just here it is, and it's installed, installed. Um, and they're often left out of grant programs as well. So I do a lot of advocacy work around ensuring that we think about the future. Um, I've got this in, in some states right now where, where they want to, the utilities want to have a separate EV load. And when you start putting uh, the EV load on a separate panel or a different load, then you're really harming that potential bi-directionality as it comes in the future and how you can utilize that. So I've really got to be thinking two, three years out as I'm doing this advocacy work to lay the groundwork for having more successful um, deployments and more efficient deployments. Uh, I think one of the great things that I'm seeing in California right now is they've really been learning the CEC has really learned a lot from the last couple of years of putting out uh, very, very large grant programs and what has worked and what hasn't. And they, they seem to be pretty nimble in saying, okay, we've heard you, 
uh, you know, a uh, first come first serve doesn't necessarily work in the application process. Um, you know, we may want to what a um, consider kind of changing up the way some of these programs are written so that we're getting faster deployments, doing a fast track lane. So if you're if you can be in the ground in six months, you're going to have priority over some other projects that might otherwise take more than twelve months. And so um, seeing those lessons being implemented. Uh, based on the policy work that's being done is is helpful. So uh, not to toot our own horn, but uh, we manage the CEC's Energize program, CalSTARTA. I was, so. <laughs> I was throwing you a bone there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so fast track is definitely one of the uh, sort of methods that we developed and recommended uh, for exactly the reason that Renee said is we want to provide funding for those that are ready to do it immediately um, that maybe don't have the same challenges as others as far as planning or utility coordination or what may be. Um, you know, we also have a going back to a hydrogen, we have a hydrogen lane as well, um, because that's such a maybe new technology is the right term there, but uh, developing technology. Um, we have a lane uh, for that as well to sort of play around with some of these unique possibilities that are occurring in that. So I, I think allowing flexibility in sort of letting the market uh, try new things is, is beneficial. I think it's the classic case of like a uh, government policy can't keep up with, with technology. I, I think that's not a secret in most sectors of, of all, you know, uh, of the world. Um, but yeah, getting back to what Renee said, I, I think allowing for for more unique situations or unique technologies, um, but then also opening it up uh, to make, if they do want to connect to the grid, making that easier too, because that is uh, somewhat challenging still for a lot of states. Um, and so making it easier if you want to, you know, pair with solar or pair with a renewable energy source uh, to make that process a little bit simpler. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one more thing because um, Terry, I think you had referenced standards earlier, uh, and so that that is a huge challenge for our industry right now because some things have been, you know, driven by things like the NIST handbook. Some things have been driven at the state level, and uh, you know, things like whether or not we mandate plug and charge, uh, what us wonks know as fifteen eleven eight. Uh, that standard. It's an ISO standard that allows you to just plug your plug in. You don't need an RFID card. You're, it's it's basically very similar to how a Tesla operates. You know, I just pull up and plug in and money comes out of my bank account. I don't, you don't think about it. Um, but various states are looking at implementing at various times, various reporting requirements, um, various standards. And it becomes very challenging for folks in the industry to be able to to have a product that will meet all the various standards and protocols for different states. And so really encouraging um, states to work with each other or to look at what other states are doing and try to replicate that as much as possible so we can, because, you know, so we can have more standardization. Thank you. Uh, I'd like let's to add briefly yeah, to ahead, that Diane. actually. Um, so not a specific policy thing um, because we can't talk about policy too much with LCF. Um, <laughs> but one thing that I do wanna add that's kind of policy adjacent that can really help with this whole topic of resiliency. And I think that there's been a lot of interest in and one thing that I know Anne and I have had a kind of as a high priority for projects for Louisiana Clean Fuels is that um, we really would like to get a statewide uh, evacuation emergency preparedness plan for all alternative fuels that exists for gas and diesel that has been developed by the state and is nice and, and codified and official and, and beautiful. Uh, I think having that for all alternative fuels be really, really nice so that we can really understand where some of the deployable technologies need to go during emergency situations, uh, during evacuation uh, situations with hurricanes and all that sort of stuff, flooding, um, especially with some of the technologies like the beam uh, charging system that uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, but also, you know, propane fueling from Amerigas or ferro gas bringing out a truck or CNG doing similar. Um, any of these technologies being deployed out in key areas would be really valuable in a lot of emergency situations. And having that kind of diverse feedstock of, all, of various fuels to rely on would be really valuable in terms of resiliency in general. And getting that sort of project underway is something that's been a bit, a bit of a priority for us. Um, for a while. So I think that that's one of the long-term goals that we'd like to see for the state is to have that kind of on paper to support all the fuels and really help with this emergency preparedness, um, you know, problem that we have in, in the state. 
Okay, yeah. since uh, since you just mentioned fuels, uh, maybe we could uh, talk about the role of alternative fuels and how they can uh, help uh, with resilience in the transportation system. Uh, we we've just been experiencing uh, disruption in the in our fuel supply right in terms of very high gasoline prices and and uh, uh, reduction in supply so uh, how do alternative fuels fit into that and and uh, how can they uh, help with the resiliency piece yeah i think what we're seeing you know on the transfer the transit maybe school district side of things is right now battery electric buses can't uh, can't do everything that they need to, them to do. Um, you know, we're still constrained by uh, range and, and weather and things like that. Um, so while they might be able to handle, you know, a good chunk of routes for transit agencies, um, it, it doesn't always cover all routes. Um, I think there's, there's one transit in, agency in the country right now that's fully electric. Um, there are no school districts that are fully electric. Um, and so it's not uncommon for them to have a mix of fuel sources, um, maybe not for a resiliency standpoint, um, but that might be sort of a, a side benefit to it um, that, you know, if they're seeing higher diesel prices or seeing higher electricity prices that they might be able to sort of move around their buses, um, at least in that side of the industry. Um, but even a mix between hydrogen and battery electric we're seeing too, um, to sort of, not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and then it does open you up for more unique uh, sort of energy uh, charging options to our, our fueling options, um, like, you know, what Renee is discussing. So I, I think, you know, just like the same finance, like a diversified portfolio is a good thing. Um, I would say the same would apply here, um, maybe more on the medium heavy duty than, than on light duty. Um, but yeah, it's certainly not gonna hurt as of now. And I think it's necessary during this sort of transition period where we're, we're not fully electric um, by any means or full zero emission, um, you're gonna see a mix for a while still. Yeah, and um, after Hurricane Sandy, when um, of course the grid was down and trees were down and trucks couldn't get into refill fueling stations for gas, some of the only vehicles on the road were the um, first responder vehicles that were fueled on natural gas. So there's, you know, those kinds of issues like that with being response ready, you know, not just mm -hmm. be resilient, but be ready for a disaster response. Yeah, and actually uh, a grid down scenario is really challenging for all of the fuels because you can't even pump it out of the mm -hmm. tank mm -hmm. in, into the vehicles. <clears throat> okay, uh, we had another question in the, in the Q&A. Since this is a new technology, I, I'm thinking the, the questioner is asking about EVs and EV charging. Since this is a new technology, many of the local permitting and inspection agencies do not have adequate training on these installations. Will the grant funding allow for training these individuals to help move the permitting and installation on a fast track? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first swipe at this one. Um, I don't believe that the funding itself will cover training, uh, like workforce training. But um, I, I do have to say that this can be a challenge. Um, there has been discussion around, there's a training program called uh, EVITP, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program, I believe. And in California, all public installations, um, at least for DC fast charging, we don't sell level two, uh, have to be, the, the technicians have to be EVITP certified. And, um, so in California, that's not a big deal. You've got electricians all over and they get certified. Uh, we ran across this, this kind of also ties in that states coordinating with each other. We ran across um, in another state where they wanted to implement this rule as well, but they wanted to put additional um, requirements, including uh, percentages of people who had to be on site that had the training. Uh, it was for all, all maintenance. So if I'm going in to fix an air, just replace an air filter in a station, I've got to have this specially certi certified person on site. And so we did a lot of discussion around like, you know, 
let, let's slow down on, on those additional requirements. And you, you can see in some parts, in some states, there's nobody for 200 miles around who has this certification. And so getting into those, those more rural um, app deployments become more expensive, if, if at all, because you're then having somebody travel, somebody, every time there's maintenance done, this, this person has to come in and uh, from someplace far away. And there's also some real equity considerations around the training. Um, so when you think about requiring one certain program rather than thinking about, well, I can, I know how to do X, Y, and Z, you know, but I don't have that certificate is that you get a lot of um, large uh, companies that have a lot of installers and they have the money to train these folks up to put them through the program. And then you have local folks, which is going to be particularly important in some of the more rural areas where there's a local electrician. Um, he knows, you know, he's he can he can do the work. He could take a test, but he de- he's not going to take days off of work to participate in this training. He just doesn't have the financial capacity to do it. So I think we also have to keep those equity considerations in mind when we're looking at some of these um, training requirements. Yeah, so on workforce development in general, I know uh, not all of the funding programs that came out of the IJA um, per- provide funding for workforce development, but the uh, LONO program through the FTA, which is on the transit side of things, does have a workforce development component to it. Uh, this year, it actually required that 5% of your grant funds go towards workforce development. Um, and so this is an issue we're seeing across uh, the entire industry of zero emissions. So whether that's on installation of charging infrastructure or bus, uh, you, know, you know, even a bus building, you know, building the actual components to it, um, but definitely uh, maintenance and operations as well. And so there is no necessary differentiation within the grant program uh, for any of those. So it could essentially go towards any of those aspects of workforce development. Um, so I highly recommend maybe uh, connecting with your state DOT. If you have any transit agencies that have applied for funding within your state or your area, um, this is something they're gonna have to spend funds on. And this is a a five-year program. So even if they didn't apply this year, they may be applying in future years. Uh, So it might be a good connection to make um, if this is funding, or or if this is something that you'd like funding for in your area, um, that there's a way to connect there and, and write that into your grant proposal. Thank you very much. And now I think uh, we're going to turn it back to Anne. Anne, uh, did you want to weigh in on that workforce development before you close this out? I've got one really quick note that I'd like to add to that, actually. Okay. Uh, I see Anne laughing. Um, I'll keep it really, really brief, though. Um, One thing on the workforce development side of things is that the NEVI program is requiring that, or at least in the proposed minimum standards, that if there's more than one um, electrician on a project, one of them has to be enrolled in a certified um, apprenticeship program so that they are working on kind of training up that next round of electricians. So that is uh, in the proposed minimum standards in terms of workforce development. Um, But then I think the question also was trying to address Uh, permitting requirements. And while there is not funding that I'm aware of for actually developing um, permitting or doing any of that training on the permitting side of things, uh, there was a a suggestion or a requirement in the state plan part of NEVI saying that states should work to identify permitting hurdles and reduce those barriers so that projects can be implemented within six months of procurement. Um, so there is a requirement to remove some of those hurdles and make permitting easier for this new technology, um, but there is no funding for it as far as I'm aware. So just to add to, to this to the notes. And does anybody have time to um, address the last question that came in just now? Uh, okay, it looks it's like more it's of a, a comment. <laughs> In Louisiana, all electrical installations must be inspected and approved by certified and registered local inspectors prior to the utility company energizing the systems. So more of a comment than a question. Um, any feedback on that or? Uh, Tyler, yeah, Tyler said he wanted to make a comment on that. Tyler? Oh, I didn't have a comment on that one. I was oh, I just okay. to comment on the previous right. one. So yeah, I would say more of a of, of a comment. Yeah, yeah that, that's really, pretty common in general um, in states. I know specifically in California, it, it's certainly required. So, 
um, yeah, I, I think that's good, but, but I think it's really common uh, to see that. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our speakers so much. Uh, you've provided so much wonderful information, and I appreciate your participation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you for, you for having, having me. And so we always want to remind everyone that all of our webinars are being recorded and they will be posted on our YouTube channel. So you just go to YouTube, type Louisiana Clean Fuels and you'll find us. And um, within a week, all of them should be posted. And if you want to go back and look at some of our past webinars, we've had different types of resiliency um, topics in the past and, and many others. So feel free to peruse and browse and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. And uh, I believe that is it. Wait, there's our contact information. And so this concludes our virtual Clean Fuel Summit for 2022. We want to let you all know that there will be an in-person Clean Fuel Summit with many more sessions um, in April of 2023. So that will be in Baton Rouge in person. So we look forward to seeing you all in person then. And until then, um, you know, we look forward to, to seeing you virtually. Thank you very much. And this concludes our webinar and the summit.